Thanks for tuning in to Ag PhD. I'm Brian Hefty. And I'm Darren Hefty. You know, we're out by a cornfield here, but I'm still thinking about next year. This field is going to be soybeans. And one of the things that we'll be watching out for is soybean cyst nematode. We'll talk about what to look for in your fields and what you can do to manage soybean cyst nematode on your farm. We'll also discuss what you do at this time of the year in terms of pulling soil samples. There's a lot of wheat that's come off now. A lot of acres can be sampled. And whether you've got wheat acres or you're thinking about sampling after corn or soybeans this fall, you need to know how to pull good soil samples. We're going to talk about that today. We have a weed of the week that is both difficult to control and also an indicator of other problems going on in your soil. We'll explain more later in the show, but first here's this week's Farm Basics. Farm Basics is brought to you by the Liberty Link Trait and Liberty Herbicide from Bayer. The most reliable weed management solution, Liberty Link and Liberty Herbicide are the link to efficient row crop production and sustainable weed management. During our Farm Basics time today, we're going to talk a little bit about how a farmer can preserve the hay that he's just baled. You know, one of the stories that I've got growing up as a kid, my, uh, my cousins lived a little bit further west into South Dakota than we were and further north, and we were going up to see my cousins. And I remember seeing these piles of hay sitting out in fields and pastures and so forth that had been there for several years. And some of the bales didn't look like they were in the best condition. I mean, not pristine like they would be immediately after they were baled. And I asked my dad, I said, why are there still piles of hay here? And he said, you know, Darren, he goes, what happens with guys as you move further west, they have a lot of dry years. And so when they have a good wet year, they'll bale a lot of hay. The ground will be very productive, whether it's grassland or alfalfa, they'll get more bales than they can possibly use that year. So they'll save them up for multiple years knowing that, hey, when we get to a dry year, we won't have enough grass for the for the cattle to graze on. We've got to use those old bales up for feed. And I got thinking about that. Wow, what do we do to preserve those bales? How do bales keep for more than one year? So every time farmers are baling, they're thinking about the long term of, I want to make sure I don't have spoilage so I have good feed. And also, I want to be able to keep those bales as long as possible because if I don't need them this year, I want to make sure they're still good for next year too. Well, the main thing here is really moisture. So farmers are trying to keep the moisture off the hay, whether it's grass hay, alfalfa hay, whatever type of hay it is, it doesn't make any difference. If it gets a whole bunch of moisture on it, there's just a much, much, much greater chance that it's going to spoil. Well, this isn't a big issue as you go to some of these western areas, like Darren mentioned, this is further west in South Dakota where they get a lot less rainfall than what we do. They're not as concerned, but as you go east in the country and they get lots of rainfall, it's a really big deal. So there are a number of different methods that farmers will use to preserve the hay, and obviously keeping it inside would be ideal, but it's a expensive to put hay inside a shed all the time. All right, well, there are different ways that you can bale up hay, whether it's big squares, large round bales, or small squares, as you're all aware. And when we look at how those bales are stacked, certainly they're stacked to try to shed water, but there's been a lot more bale wrap being used than has ever been used before. The other thing is just as they're being baled up, we're looking at having the tightest bales we can have and that the looser the bale is the more air and water can penetrate into that bale so farmers will try to do everything they can to make those bales whether it's a small square or a big round bale wrapped as tightly as they can together to try to repel as much water and keep the oxygen out as well. All right, why don't you talk about hay preservatives and what that can do for a farmer. The big thing that farmers will look at is what's the weather forecast when I'm going to cut my hay between the time I'm going to cut it and how long it's going to take for that hay to dry and then I can get it baled. If let's just say we're in the middle of the summer and a farmer figures, you know, if I can cut that hay, if I can leave it lay out in the sun for a couple of days, it'll be dry enough that I can bale it. So they'll look at the forecast. If it's not not going to rain for a two or three day period, they'll start cutting hay like crazy and then try to get it bailed up. Well, on the, on the chance that, you know, the weather forecast changed, now it looks like it might rain. Farmers will say, ooh, I want to try and get that hay, but it's not quite ready. So with the baling equipment, they can try to crimp or, or bend some of that hay a little bit to squish out some of that moisture to help that hay cure up a little more quickly. Also, they can use some acid type preservatives or bacterial type preservatives. So even if the hay is a little bit more wet, they can reduce any potential spoilage that they may have. How about safety to the livestock with the preservatives? Some non-farmers will ask that and be very concerned 
concerned, oh, you're going to spray something on there. That can't be good. There's really no safety issue at all. When you look at uh, what, uh, say, a, a cow is going to eat, uh, when we're putting corn silage in a silo, uh, when we're putting a hay preservative on, uh, we aren't talking about anything that's foreign uh, to what that cow's diet is going to be. In fact, when you look at corn stalks, a lot of times you'll have cattle grazing corn stalks in the fall. They prefer the ones that have a little bit of rot to them. They're a little softer, a little easier to chew. Now, when I'm looking at the human food supply, I don't want something that's rotting. Yeah, I but want you something make that's this case, so fresh. then why would a farmer put preservative on at all? Well, they want that to be fresh and healthy for their livestock, and they don't want to have spoilage because they may keep it for a long term. For cattle, if they're out chewing on stalks, hey, that's today's meal, and a little bit of rot is no big deal. But if I have hay that I want to keep for two or three years, I certainly can't have any rot. The other thing that can happen when you get some rot going. If let's just say you put the hay into a hay shed, now you could have a fire if some heat gets going in there. That would be a really bad thing too. Well, once again, it's very important for farmers to do everything they can to preserve hay for the short term and especially for the long term. The other thing is that's really important for farmers is to control weeds, whether it's in a hay field or anywhere else on their farm. If you have this week's weed of the week, you want to get it under control. Can you identify this week's weed? What's next in wheat control technology? Roundup Ready 2 Extend Soybeans will provide tolerance to dicamba and glyphosate and will be built on the Genuity Roundup Ready to Yield trade. See them in action at extendfollowafield.com. I will take action against herbicide resistant weeds. I will know my weeds and I will stop them before they go to seed. I will do whatever it takes to give my crops the upper hand. And I will use multiple herbicide sites of action because every action counts. I will take action, this time, for all time. The world of farming is changing. Titan Machinery and Case IH are here to make sure you're ready. The demands on agriculture keep growing. The challenge for producers is to continue to keep pace. To be successful, you'll need equipment that can get the most out of every inch of land, innovations that help you work faster, and advice from people who know your field as well as they know your equipment. Don't get left behind. Be ready with Case IH and Titan Machinery. Better solutions. Looking to maximize yield? Quickroots is a microbial seed inoculant that allows the plant root to explore a greater volume of soil, the key to higher yields. Quickroots continues to generate yield response on corn, soybeans, wheat, and more. Quickroots is applied to the seeds so the live microorganisms go right to work, enhancing seedling vigor, increasing the uptake of certain nutrients, including NPK, and expanding root volume. Maximize yield on your farm this season. Call TJ Technologies or your local dealer and get your Quickroots today. A farmer's attention to detail is what makes the difference. You take the time for service management because you know how vital it is to your operation. You service your field like everything else because soil sampling makes all the difference and gets the results you want. Download the app Soil Test Pro and start grid sampling today. Keep your farm growing strong. The more you test, the more you know. A proven herbicide for decades, dicamba can provide burn down residual control of tough and resistant weeds for up to 14 days. That's another reason why farmers will use dicamba for years to come. Brought to you by Roundup Ready Plus Weed Management Solutions. Soybean cyst nematode may be the worst yield robber in soybeans in the United States. You know, we've been dealing with some of these problems that there's no tremendous answer for, whether it's Goss's wilt in corn or soybean cyst nematode in soybeans. We just can't completely eliminate the problem. Right. However, there are some tools that we can use to manage soybean cyst nematode. That's what we'd like to outline today. Okay, here's the number one tool. Don't plant soybeans. Rotate away from soybeans. <laughs> oh, that's a, that's well, a good option. I'm just saying, if you go two years 
away from soybeans, that dramatically lowers that population of soybean cyst nematode. And even just a one year switch, if you're going soybeans after soybeans after soybeans, obviously you're going to have a lot more problem because you've got a host out there. All right. Well, if you are going to plant soybeans, the most obvious thing is, well, plant the soybean cyst nematode resistant varieties. However, when we look at these resistant varieties, they're resistant to some strains of soybean cyst nematode, but there are several strains out there and most farmers don't really have a good handle on which strain they have. We'll talk about the strains real quick. There isn't really much to talk about, Brian. What we're looking at is the resistance sources that we have in our soybean varieties and most of the soybean varieties that are quote unquote resistant to soybean cyst nematode all come from the Fayette gene, the PI8788 gene. And you know, I don't know hardly any farmers across the country that even know that, number one. Uh, number two, you say, well, okay, if we're all taking these resistant varieties from the same cross, why don't we take a different cross, take a different source of resistance like Peking, for example. And you'll see some different seed companies almost every year. They'll come out with some big push. Hey, we've got this different source of nematode resistance. We've got a Peking variety. And then that Peking variety yields five bushel less than everything else. And even uh, I know at Iowa State, I was at some training there just a couple of years ago. And we were talking about this, that well, why don't we plant these Peking? King varieties. So they found fields that had nematodes that should be controlled by these Peking varieties. So they planted the Peking, planted the Fayette varieties in the same field. Guess which yielded more? It wasn't the Peking. And that's why the seed companies have not been coming with more Peking sources of resistance. They just haven't found any that really yield well. So it doesn't really matter what strain you have out there. We've only got one decent source of resistance that's still in germplasm that can yield. All right, so here's the other big thing you need to do if you've got soybean cyst nematodes in your area and especially on your farm, just do everything else to raise a good healthy crop. In other words, if all you have for a stress is SCN, it's not nearly as big an issue as if you also have poor drainage or high pH or weed problems or bug problems or disease problems or lack of fertility. Solve all those problems first. We see the most issue in high pH soils. Well, why do you have high pH soils? In almost all cases, it's poor drainage. Get more tile out there. In a lot of cases, we see this in I Iowa and Minnesota and guys say, well, I already have tile every 50 or 70 feet. Yeah, but you have some of the best soil in the world. You need tile every 20 or 30 feet in some cases on this really good heavy ground and you could be raising 80 bushel soybeans. But until you fix that drainage problem, you're not going to fix the pH problem, which means your cyst nematode problem is going to seem like, oh my goodness, it's costing me 30 bushels. No, the cyst nematode's probably only costing you 10. It's all these other factors that are costing you the extra 20. You know, the other thing that many farmers across the country you're turning to is seed treatment options for soybean cyst nematode. And while they do look promising, especially in small plots where we know we've got nematodes and we're comparing with that treatment versus where we don't have it, the problem with soybean seed treatments is we've got to put it on the whole field, even though nematodes may just be in pockets of the field. So the first one that really came out was Poncho Votivo. That definitely does show an advantage. It's not the yeah, Poncho has nothing to do with it. It's the Votivo. It's, it's the Votivo portion and that kind of repels nematodes and it's a biological and that's all good, but it's not this huge increase in yield that guys are really looking for. And the cost was high enough that the return on investment was not great unless you knew you had a big problem and had a stressful year too. Now we've got a new one, Clariva Complete this year that's come out and it'll be interesting this fall to see what kind of yield data there yeah. is when we get out on farms. All right, so again, what you can do, do everything to raise a great crop, rotate away from soybeans, use resistant varieties. But what we're all hoping for is two things to come on the market at some point. It's probably gonna be years though. One is a product that actually kill all nematodes out in your field. You spray it out there, we get rid of all the nematodes. There are many companies working on that. Nobody has anything great to this point. The other thing we'd love to see is a biotech trait that doesn't have yield drag, but does kill all the nematodes, not just repel them, but actually kill them. That also is in the works, but it's gonna be a lot of years in my opinion before we see that on the market. So again, the best thing you can do right now, do everything else to manage your crop well. Well, the same may be true for our weed of the week. While you may not be able to kill this weed very easily, we certainly can manage other things out there to slow it down or perhaps eliminate it. We'll explain coming up in our weed of the week segment later in the show. Being a farmer means securing your land and livelihood for the future. Harvest solutions from Capello USA have the grit to get you there. Our product lines for corn, sunflowers, and forage are designed for efficiency and longevity, preventing harvest loss while minimizing maintenance and downtime. 
To do everything you can to advance your farmland to the next generation, call us at 855-CAPELLO or visit us at capellousa.com. Capello USA, Italian craftsmanship, American grit. We know that the future is liquid. That's why Agroculture Liquid Fertilizer's corporate sales force is the best trained, best equipped in the industry. Because our communications, our relationships, our ethics are as strong and as innovative as the products we design. That's why our customers trust us. Agroculture Liquid Fertilizers, helping you grow the future. Experience matters in farming, and when it comes to efficient power, no one has more experience than Case IH. Our industry-leading SCR engine technology has powered over 35,000 pieces of equipment and has over 17 million operating hours in North America alone. It was the right solution from the start, and it's proving itself right again as our new generation of Tier 4B equipment takes to the field. Proven power, proven efficiency, proven in the field. Case IH, be ready. Get the most from the genetic potential in your crops. Reduce plant stress and increase yield. BioForge upregulates key genes to keep roots growing and reduce ethylene for improved plant stress tolerance. BioForge mixes well with other products for easy application with every pass through the field. BioForge, progressive grower's choice to improve root growth, reduce crop stress, and increase yield. Make every growing day count with BioForge from Stoller USA. If you watch Ag PhD TV, you'll love the new Ag PhD radio show each weekday on Rural Radio Sirius XM Channel 80. This is Darren Hefty. On the new Ag PhD radio program, we'll take live callers and provide the agronomic information and brotherly banter you've come to expect from Ag PhD. We'll feature a Back 40 segment where we talk to farmers and agronomists around the country to share what's going on with crop production. And it wouldn't be Ag PhD without addressing a pest of the day. Tune in to the Ag PhD radio show each weekday at 2 p.m. Central on Rural Radio Sirius XM Channel 80. One of the most important things you can do if you want more yield and more profit next year is to pull good soil samples this summer or this fall. You know, when we talk about pulling soil samples, a lot of farmers that I talk to across the country say, well, I'm going to have to get my fertilizer dealer to come out and pull some samples. And I just think about this, you know, just objectively think about it. Uh, if you have your fertilizer dealer who's going to say, I'm going to pull the sample, that's going to tell me how much fertilizer, how much of my product you need to buy to get your field in shape. It just seems like there's a little bit of a conflict of interest there. And if I was so, a unscrupulous fertilizer dealer, I may go to a part of the field that, you know, looks like it's not raising a very good crop and uh, find the lowest fertility value that I can find. So when I pull that sample, you have to buy more of my product. And you know, in my mind, that's how it works. And I realize most fertilizer dealers are pretty honest across the country, but, but still, it just seems like there's that little window there. Or the other side you could look at is, what if they don't really know what they're doing? They don't really know my field as well as I do. How do they know where to pull these samples at? I don't know. It just seems like something we need to know how to do ourselves. So what we've done at Ag PhD is we've developed a new app for you that you can download on your smartphone or your iPad. It's called Ag PhD soil test, just real simple. This soil testing thing is something that anybody can do. All you have to do is download this app. You can check out your field, any one that you want to go to, and set up grid points. Real simple. But anyway, the reason why we developed this in part is because there are so many young people who've come back into agriculture and a lot of their dads, their grandpas are saying, hey, what else can I do on the farm to make some more money and how can I get my young person involved in the farm? This is a great job for them. Send them out doing some soil samples. It's simple, it's easy, they can do it after wheat harvest, after corn harvest, soybean harvest, whatever. You know, and that's another thing I guess we should bring up right now. When I said you could sample late in the summer, you can. We prefer fall samples, okay? The reason why is because mineralization should be pretty well done. In other words, every year, organic matter is going to break down in your soil and release some nutrients. You want that to be complete for the year because then you pretty much know what you've got going into the next year. If you're in the middle of the summer, then there could still be some more nutrients that are actually coming available and are going to be ready to go for next year's crop. So in other words, in some cases, 
you may over apply fertilizer when you sample early. But the big thing is we just want you to be consistent from year to year. If you sample September 1 every year right after your wheat harvest, then sample September 1 every single year, not August 1 some years, October 1 other years, spring other years. Try to be consistent with your sample time. You know, if you're just getting started with this, I would say, all right, let's look at a corn and soybean rotation. Maybe you say, you know what? I'm just getting started. I've got quite a few acres. I'm just going to work on every fourth year. So I'll do a yeah, fourth of my ground each year. That would be an okay way to get started. If you find some problem fields where, wow, something's really out of whack. I'm going to be putting on a lot of lime or making a lot of adjustments right. in this field. You probably want to start sampling that field every year or at least every other year just to see if your management tactics that you're using are starting to make an impact. Yeah, if nothing else, I'd take at least one field on my farm and I'd sample that every year and I'd maybe try some dramatic things we have on our farm just to see how quickly we can make changes, how much yield that impacts, how much that helps our profit, all those kind of things. Here's probably the most important thing I'll tell you. This job is simple. You can do this job or somebody on your farm can do this job and if you have good soil samples, you do a good job pulling samples, we can really help you adjust your fertility program, get more yield and make more money going into next year. One other thing that will definitely help your farm make more money is controlling our Weed of the Week. We'll show you how coming up next. Your time is valuable. That's why you need a Hagee STS application system. Hagee STS products are designed for precision and efficiency, allowing you to make applications all season long with just one machine. Contact your Hagee rep today. Our Weed of the Week is cattails, and if you see cattails, that tells you one thing, you've got too much water in that area of your field. Well, you definitely can improve your uh, uh, cattail situation by improving the drainage through those areas. Now, well, a lot yeah, of times but, we'll... but before we get to that though, Darren, we gotta say, hey, if this is in a true wetland situation, it's a pond, we're not suggesting that you drain your ponds or drain your wetlands. But if it's in a field situation, that's a different deal. That's kind of what I was getting at here is you look at in a field situation, cattails can pop up at about any time during a wet year. So sometimes guys will say, well, I've got a few cattails on the side of a hill They've never been there before. I don't know how that happened. How do I control them? Hey, this is one thing. Yeah, we got some herbicide solutions, but maybe you do have some drainage issues where you say, gosh, there's a little roll through that hill. If we put some drain tile in there, that's regular farm ground. It's not a wetland. That would be a good long-term fix. The problem with controlling cattails, number one, we don't have a lot of herbicides that will do it. And number two, you're talking about very waxy leaves. They're not going to absorb a lot of pesticides. So you want to take any pesticide that is labeled, let's take Roundup, for example, and you want to use the highest labeled rate and the lowest labeled water volume. If that means a gallon or three gallons, whatever's on the label, you want to go all the way down to that. Absolutely, don't even think about using 10 or 20 gallons of water per acre. All that's going to happen is your herbicide's going to run off. Have extremely concentrated droplets, you will get much better control. Since there are a few, if any, products really labeled for cattail control, this is a problem you have to address with a burn down or this fall after the crop comes off. Or, or you may just have to kill a small area of your crop if cattails are so bad that you have to do something about it right away. We found Pursuit has done a little bit in soybeans if you get the cattails and they're relatively small. Roundup has been effective, as you mentioned, if we're using low water volumes. That's really about it as far as control options. Well, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of good control options for you, but you've got to address this weed. It is a tough one, but also make sure you're fixing the drainage if you can in a field situation. That's it for our Weed of the Week, but stay tuned. Iron Talk is coming up next. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. What are farmers doing to feed the planet? They're using Quadtrek technology, soil management, and planting systems from Case IH to foster a better growing environment that maximizes yield potential. Visit CaseIH.com to be ready. Today's Iron Talk will discuss the cooling system in your tractor. While it's getting hot outside, it doesn't have to heat up in the comfort of your tractor cap. With a few simple maintenance tips and a realistic outlook, you'll have no trouble keeping cool this summer. First of all, here's what you should expect from the air conditioning unit in your tractor. In most tractors, the air conditioning system is capable of cooling up to 30 degrees Fahrenheit off the ambient air temperature. If a particular day has highs in the 80s, no problem. You can cool your cab down into the 50s if you'd like. However, these days where the air temperature rises into the upper 90s or even 100 degrees, you need to consider your cooling system's capabilities before calling the service shop. 
Temperatures in the 70s may be all you can expect inside your cab. If your cooling system isn't even achieving that, then you can turn to maintenance items that may improve performance. The one thing I would look at is the air conditioner's condenser. Watch for bent or dirty fins. Depending on the make and model of the tractor that you're working on, inspecting the condenser may be a simple job. If cleaning is necessary, use an air compressor rather than a power washer. High pressure water spray can easily bend fins, which in turn adds to more problems. Also, water can build up, leading to potential corrosion issues as well. There are obviously many more potential problems that could lead to poor cooling with your air conditioner. Just keep in mind that your air conditioner can only take about 30 degrees off the ambient air temperature, and if you have problems, Check the things that you can, like the condenser, and then call your local equipment dealer for more tips on keeping your tractor cab cool this summer. That's all for this week's Iron Talk, and now, back to the show. Wake up. Breakfast is served. Your roots crave pee. Most of your applied pee gets tied up in the soil, a natural phenomenon known as phosphorus fixation. Fix the problem with Avail Phosphorus Fertilizer Enhancer. Avail makes more pee available to your roots. Here, here, and here. Increasing pee availability can lead to increased pee uptake in the plant. That's more pee, more pee, and more pee. More phosphorus for your crop can be more results in your bin. An average of 9.6 bushels per acre of corn. Breakfast is served. Supercharge your pee with Avail. The world of farming is changing. Titan Machinery and Case IH are here to make sure you're ready. The demands on agriculture keep growing. The challenge for producers is to continue to keep pace. To be successful, you'll need equipment that can get the most out of every inch of land, innovations that help you work faster, and advice from people who know your field as well as they know your equipment. Don't get left behind. Be ready with Case IH and Titan Machinery. Better solutions. I will take action against herbicide-resistant weeds. I will know my weeds, and I will stop them before they go to seed. I will do whatever it takes to give my crops the upper hand, and I will use multiple herbicide sites of action because every action counts. I will take action, this time for all time. Being a farmer means securing your land and livelihood for the future. Harvest Solutions from Capello USA have the grit to get you there. Our product lines for corn, sunflowers, and forage are designed for efficiency and longevity, preventing harvest loss while minimizing maintenance and downtime. To do everything you can to advance your farmland to the next generation, call us at 855-CAPELLO or visit us at capellousa.com. Capello USA, Italian craftsmanship, American grit. Dirty work pays. That is if your dirty work includes a Soil Max Gold Digger tile plow. Soil Max tile plows feature zero deflection technology. With the only tile plow factory paired with Ag Leaders and Teleslope control system, you eliminate the need for grade calculations and lasers. So make your next investment in a Soil Max Gold Digger. Better yield, longer planting and harvest windows, better water management is all yours with Soil Max. Visit SoilMax.com. Closed captioning for Ag PhD is sponsored by Norwood Sales. The all-new S-Cube Commercial Tender is the only tender on the market with poly tanks, giving you the capability to haul seed, fertilizer, water, or liquid fertilizer. Each cube can hold 300 units of seed, 2,000 gallons of liquid, or 300 cubic feet of fertilizer. Options include full-functioning wireless remote, stainless steel conveyors, and self-contained hydraulics. Get yours today at Norwood Sales. Well, we hope you've enjoyed our television show today, but we invite you to also listen to Ag PhD Radio. That's every weekday at 2 p.m. Central on Sirius XM Channel 80. Every day we take your live phone calls and answer your agronomic questions. Well, we hope you'll tune in to next week's Ag PhD television program as well, where we'll have another Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD. No one cares more for the environment than family farmers who plan to pass their land down to their children. These same farmers are working to double yields over the next 15 to 20 years to feed the growing world. To learn how they plan to do it, visit the Responsible Nutrient Management Foundation at rnmf.org.